Chapter 2, A Quaker Girlhood. It is easy to understand why John Payne, having become a staunch friend, began to find the climate of his native Virginia uncongenial to his spiritual nature. The Virginia planters, as a rule, were distinctly non-religious, if not irreligious. The supremacy of the Church of England in the southern colonies had fallen with the fall of England's political power. Church buildings lay in ruins. Baptismal fonts had been transformed into watering troughs. The communion chalice was used to hold the morning dram. Rust covered the bells, which once summoned congregations to praise and prayer, and the parsons had fallen away, had fled away overseas, with none to bid them Godspeed or to waste a lament over their departure. Yet this downfall of the established church had not made dissent popular. The feeling was still pre prevalent, which inspired the remark made by Madison, a man, must, a man may be a Christian in any church, but a gentleman must belong to the Church of England. From the beginning, Quakers especially, had, looked, had been looked upon with an intolerance strange in view of the peacefulness of the doctrines of the sect. In early Virginia history, we find it set down as a crime against a citizen that he had shown himself very loving to Quakers. And again, we read of a court of life and death consisting of the governor of the province and any three of the 16 counselors whereat are tried Quakers and nonconformists. All this actual persecution was a thing of the past long before John Payne came to the resolution of quitting Virginia. In 1717, the king revealed the law prohibit the, the king repealed the law prohibiting the assemblage of Quakers, and the famous Bill of Rights, which Madison helped to frame, distinctly declared that religion, or the duty we owe to our Creator, and the manner of discharging it, can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence, and therefore all men are equally entitled to the free exercise of religion according to the dictates of conscience. There is a wide gulf between toleration and sympathy, however, and it was quite natural that John Payne should look longingly to the companionship of his spiritual kindred who dwelt on the banks of the Schuylkill and the Delaware. He desired, moreover, educational advantages for his children greater than the plantation life of Virginia could afford, and therefore, after a preliminary visit which he and his wife made to Philadelphia in the spring of 1779, he decided definitely to break the old ties and take up his residence in the North. His first preparation for the important change, which he contemplated with this, what his first preparation for the important change which he contemplated was the setting free of all his blacks whose condition of slavery had long weighed heavily upon his conscience. Some of these servants, however, refused to accept their liberty and prayed their master to take them with him to his new home in Philadelphia. Among these was, Mary, was Mother Amy, who was at last accorded the privilege of continuing in the service of the family with the proviso that she should be paid for her labor. The wages thus received she frugally laid away and at her death bequeathed the sum of $500 to her, her mistress. Having thus, for conscience sake, given up that large share of his property which lay in slaves, John Payne set his household in order for the journey, which to him was more like a pilgrimage to the city of brotherly love. The distance set down on the map as some 200 miles conveys little notion of what that journey involved of difficulty, discomfort, and even danger. Travel by packet sloop was the most comfortable mode of conveyance. 
but slow and tedious. Moreover, these packets plied only between important points, and passage in them was not to be had without much prearrangement and tedious delay. Yet travel by land was still more difficult and fatiguing. Outside Philadelphia lay black and treacherous quagmires in which the horses floundered and struggled for hours, making no progress toward getting out, while some of the hills were so steep that wagons must pause till other teams came to their assistance. These wagons had no springs, and the unlucky passengers were jolted from side to side as the wheels of the vehicle rolled over rocks or sank to the hubs in mud. Pog progress was so slow that days and even weeks were consumed in journeys which could now be accomplished in a few hours. John Payne, whether he had traveled by packet down the James from Richmond and up the weary length of Chesapeake Bay, or by coach through Alexandria and Baltimore, must have felt all the, felt all the hardships of his pilgrimage were rewarded, and that he had reached his Mecca when the roofs and steeples of Philadelphia rose before his view on the shores of the Schuylkill. An entry upon which I chanced in an old diary kept by one of the Payne's neighbors enabled me to fix exactly the date of this migration. For under the date of July 9th, 1783, Elizabeth Drinker notes among the events of the day, John Payne's family came to reside in Philadelphia. At the time of his northward mark migration at the close of the Revolutionary War, Philadelphia was the metropolis of America, a thriving town with a population of 32,000 inhabitants. Its houses numbered about over 4,000, most of which sheltered well-clad, well-fed, well-to-do citizens, free livers on a small scale and prodigal within the compass of a guinea. Small as the city was in comparison with its ex extent and magnitude today, it was even then not destitute of fine buildings and historic spots. Dolly Payne's eyes, unused to city sights, must have opened wide at her first glimpse of Christ Church with its quaint steeple and its famous chimes of bells imported out of England at a cost of 900 pounds. At sight of the old church house of Carpenter's Hill and the State House, where America's independence had its birth. On the banks of the Delaware at Shechemaxon, near the governor's house, the treaty elm was still standing to call up before the girl's youthful imagination the vision of William Penn with his blue silk sash about his waist, surrounded by the Indians arranged in form as a half moon. Other sites upon which her eyes rested were less beautiful and less elevating in their associations. At the west end of the market on 3rd Street stood a platform raised from the ground some eight or ten feet for the benefit of the curious, and in its center rose two rude instruments of punishment, the whipping post and the pillory. Here on Saturday, which was high market day, between 10 and 11 in the morning, the miserable victims of the law stood with head and arms ignominiously pinned, or still worse, with clothes stripped to the waist and backs bleeding from the strokes of the lash, while school children looked on with eager curiosity as at a spectacle. Dolly Payne's heart was far too tender to take pleasure in any such scenes of suffering. More to her taste were the strolls along the riverside or over the western commons, or best of all on the shady side of Chestnut Street where the bells and bows were taking their afternoon promenade. Here the young fashionables congregated in great numbers and always attired as for a dress parade. The men were arrayed in very tight small clothes and silk stockings, with pointed shoes ornamented with shining buckles. 
Their waistcoats were often of bright colors, and the outer coats with several little capes were adorned with silver buttons from whose size and number the owner's wealth might be guessed. Old men carried gold-headed canes, which, being a badge of gentility, were always very much in evidence. The women were attired even more gorgeously than the cavaliers who bowed and flourished and scraped before them. Their gowns of brocade were of a prodigious fullness, as needs must be when the hoops spread out like a balloon. The muskmelon and calabash bonnets were of correspondingly wide dimensions, and altogether a woman prepared for the promenade resembled a ship under full sail. We will continue later.